And it was always something in the back of my mind, like, I, I want to know why. Like, why it just doesn't happen. All good things just happen. Some good, bad things happen to good people sometimes. Nah, life isn't, life's just not fair. Nah, that doesn't solve it for me. Let's do it. All right, here we go. This is the Living Numbers Podcast, where the numbers tell the story, but the people give it purpose. Of course, make sure you all subscribe. That's how you get the extra episodes on Apple and Spotify. Me and and the wonderful doctor here, we just had a great conversation about gaming, about being fathers for the first time. And there's, there's tons of stuff in that first 10 minutes, but you got to subscribe to get the good stuff. That's extra. Okay. So without further ado, you all know, whenever we have somebody on for the first time, we have to give them an elaborate intro. So the good doctor here doesn't know about this intro because I didn't send it to him in our notes and I do that purposely. So this is from all of my digging and my fact checking. All right, here we go. Hailing from Murrells Park, Illinois. He must not like the sun because he went from Arizona State University back to the University of Illinois, Chicago to earn his degree in business management. He then pivoted to earn his doctorate from Parker College in chiropractic and alternative Healthcare. We have another doctor here on the Living Numbers podcast. Growing from modest beginning, sports kept him sane when he didn't have much. You know, you got two people who came from nothing here. Much like Michael Jordan, he believes in using what you have to become successful. Author, borderline pro baseball player, Mr. Beef. Multi time CEO. Shout out to Empower Your Reality. I present the Dr. Vic Monzo. Say hello to the people. I appreciate having me on, brother. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, anything I get wrong in that intro, I always like to fact check that stuff. I love the sun, but that's a whole other story we can talk about. We'll get into <laughs> it. I have a feeling. <laughs> Definitely. That was okay, good stuff, so man. We're gonna, that was good stuff. I'm glad. I'm glad. You know, you got to kind of peruse around the bios and everything. And I like to listen to you on other stuff just to make sure like you're not boring. Because it's possible to have somebody with an amazing story, but they're not really a talker. So you get them on, you're like, oh, I don't know if I could put this one out. But hey, I don't I'll think make, this is going to be one of those. I'll make sure I'll do a little talking here. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to get into our first number here. So at 12 years old, you set a course to figure out life. That's awesome at 12. I'm a high school teacher, so I see 14, 15, 18, 19 year olds, and they have no idea. And they know they don't have no idea. And some of them don't. They're like, oh, yeah, I got to figure it out. I'm like, okay, you just wait. Okay, so (laughs) what was it about having people in your family who did well and some who didn't? That maybe pushed you to ask this question or to kind of make this statement. I believe you made it to your mother. Yeah, I did. It was it was a statement I made to my mom because it was one of the things. There was a couple things I was looking at. One of them was like we were talking about gaming before, right? And and uh, I said I never had. You said Nintendo sixty four, and I said I never had that. And one of the reasons why is I I my parents didn't really have a lot for games, game gaming stuff like that. So. I had to try to save money sometimes. So like Super Nintendo was the, only, the one thing that I really wanted to have when it came out, but I had to, I had to put money to the side to accumulate it. But I had family members who had every every console you can think of of 50, 60, 70 games, uh, everything in the books, and, and friends are somewhere like that. Some weren't, some were. And I just was like, I don't get it. I see some people suffer, some people don't. Why? Like, why is it like that? Mm. It really frustrated me. And so I remember I was telling my mom, I'm going to figure out this thing called life. And I didn't know what I was talking about, but I wouldn't say like I had a, this elaborate explanation. I, it was really just because I saw like just such a big di- difference and I was part of the one that I didn't want to be a part of. And I was just like, why is this happening? And I was like, I'm going to mm. figure this out because 
why why can't I just choose to have that and have it? And it just it really felt like there was a limit to me. And so that was the pressing thing. And my mom was just looking at me like, okay, that's a that's a tall order. Okay, yeah. Now you can just tell by our look. But it was one of those things where uh it's funny how life led, you know, it's not like I always thought about it because it was just that moment and then as time went on, I kind of let that go. Uh, but then I came back to it and then it became, look, now when I look at, now I look at what I'm doing, I'm like, it's funny. Oh man, is that funny how that thing circled around? It was like your subconscious makes sure that you were continuing to have that as an underlying goal was to kind of figure out, figure out, figure out life. Right. We put that in quotes cause it's, it's such a broad thought. Um, what other questions if you could think of any, did you ask yourself at that age, what was something else that you thought like, huh, that's kind of weird or that's different? You know, I came from a very big religious background. So born mm. and raised in Italian Roman Catholic, and I was very involved with the church. I mean, I was an altar boy at eight years old to like 14, I think right before high school. Um, and that was what the good boys do. So I had to be that good boy and a good mm. Italian boy coming from the Italian culture and, you know, follow the roots. Um, man, there's a lot of questions I had. I mean, I questioned, you know, things from religion, how to connect with God, how to be a better, you know, person, how not to be a sinner. Um, cause I was really curious about life. I still am to this day. Like nothing's changed. I'm still the same, you know, same person. I'm still curious, even though as I learned so much, so much as I've learned in the last 20 something years, uh, through this journey, I'm still always curious because there's just so much more. How can we go deeper? How can we get more simple with the message? How can I, you know, because when I was a kid, I wanted, I, I thought like I was always looking for that common denominator or like what's, how can I sum everything up? And um, <laughs> even in high school with sports and even in college, it was like I had always this curiosity of like trying to figure, figure things out in some way. Hmm. And I've always been a deep person. I, I used to be, that, that, that was a complaint from people like, oh, you, you always want to go deep. You always want to have these deep convos. I'm like, I, I feel like that's more meaningful. I, I feel good with those convos. I don't like these superficial things. I want to go deep. That's just, that's, I think that's mm. what life about. And so I wouldn't say I had any specific, it was just so many. Um, it, but the biggest one that I always remember st- standing out was the the big polarity of difference, like seeing someone suffer or having a family, mm. you know, family member may suffer. Or I see someone go through, you know, someone going through a divorce and it's just like, why does that have to happen? Like, why, why do we have to see this? And it, it didn't make sense to me. And it was really pressing on my heart because it really bothered me a lot. I had family members that went through stuff, friends and stuff. And and it was always something in the back of my mind, like, I, I want to know why. Like, why? It just doesn't happen. All good things just happen. Some good, bad things happen to good people sometimes. Nah, life isn't, life's just not fair. Nah, that doesn't solve it for me. Like, because it was just a quick, like, shut me up kind of statement. Right? And I'm not saying they meant right. to do that, uh, but that's what it felt like to me. And, like, they were just, it's a statement that, you know, all right, we're going to end it there. That's why. And I was just like, nah, there's got to be something more. There's just got to be some more. And I always kept that hunger and curiosity about it. And still to so today. So what experience or memory made you realize like, dang, I don't, I don't have that much. Like we, there's other people who have a lot more stuff. Was it just the video games? Was that the eye opener? Like take us back to that memory. Like where were you? Who was around? If you can. Yeah, I can. I mean, it was everything. I mean, you go into someone's house and it's just a big house and everything just all well, nice. And, you know, my house wasn't like that. So I saw a lot of lack of what I didn't have. Right. I played sports and here I am coming just with the cleats. And I played baseball for 25 years. I never owned my own personal bat. Wow. Go figure that. I'm a baseball Bats player. That's are expensive. I know. Right. And so I never owned my own personal bat. My dad, you know, through, through when I was in high school, I remember he, um, he had some connections, who knows what, but long story short, he was able to give me some really high end base, my baseball glove, uh, at a really discounted price. And so I remember having one of those and people like, wow, that's like a $300 glove. I'm like, I paid 75 bucks for it. I, I didn't pay for my dad. This. So I'm like, I don't know. He, he, somebody had it and selling it. And he, he got it. Um, but it was one of those things where, you know, just seeing like, you know, I go to baseball games and everyone has their own personal bag and all their stuff in there. And here I am holding mm-hmm. my cleats and, And I did that throughout my whole career. Um, I think I got used to it because I was just so I had to learn how to be simple. Um, So it was like, you know, I I, I, all I all I needed was batting gloves. um, And I didn't have those until high school. And, you know, I had my cleats and that was it. And I show up the games. Um, It you know, it's just one of those things where you kept seeing like all these people had all these little things, all these little gadgets. 
I knew I didn't have those and it was easy to pick out mm. what I didn't have. And so that's where, you know, there's, there's a lot of things of why I was noticing that, the, all that, like even cars, you know, you go to a friend, you know, they, you're one in someone's car and it's like a Mercedes or a BMW and it's like considered extremely high end in my world. So, um, you just see a lot of, you see a lot of the lack of what I didn't have in those, that way. And, uh, yeah, it was games, it was toys, it was, you name it. Um, uh, you know, but I'm not saying I didn't have toys. I did. I got hand-me-downs. I had other things. My parents did the best they can. They bought stuff when they could. Mm-hmm. So I greatly appreciate what they did. Um, but it's just one of those things where you, you know, you can tell that there's other people who had more stuff than you or in some way. And as a kid, I, you just, you just, I just saw it and I saw the big difference there. How'd that make you feel? Um, uh, you know, I felt at the time, I mean, it didn't feel good, but it was one of those things where it was like, um, like I wasn't lucky or I didn't, you know, whatever, but, but th- there was stuff that came out of that though, too. Cause I was like, it, it, it inspired me to be like, you know, like, mm. like I, I, I wanted the new super Nintendo came right. And I had people that had it and I was like, I'm going to get it somehow. I'm going to figure out how to get that. And I'm going to start saving my money and whatever money I get, any pennies, a dollar here, whatever. And it was like, it took me six months, but I ended up having the money. I had enough money to buy the system and buy two games on top of it. And I was the nice. happiest kid in the world when that happened. Right. So as much as it, it, it was something that brought a lot of like low vibration emotions or negative emotions, uh, not feeling worthy or, you know, not being able to, cause I can't get that. So I'm not worthy to have it to also bring like, well, I'm going to do what I can or make the best of it. And it's funny because a model I used in high school, and I used to share this with my cousin who I hung out with a lot, we had a model. We make the best of everything. And yep. we take a, I mean, we did stuff like, for example, we take a tennis ball in my dad's, in our basement, in my, at my parents' house, four guys. So it's my, my old, my cousin and his younger brother was my other cousin and a friend of ours. And we would play a game called a tennis ball game. I mean, we made the best of everything. And you had to bounce it, but you had to try to freak the person out so that they, if they catch it, if they miss it, they're out. You know, if they don't catch it. So we had to fake them as much. I mean, where do we come up with this? Who knows? We just made the best of everything. And I think that's the beauty of, you know, you take from that lifestyle. Like I said, everything comes, there's a positive of everything. And it's one of those things where as much as I didn't feel good, but it also taught me to enjoy what you have. And as I got older, you know, it's in the place in my life where it's like, you know, I appreciate what I do have and mm-hmm. in, in, in some way, shape or form. And I'm, you know, I'm in a place where I can get anything I want, but at the same token, it's like, I appreciate that I don't need to have everything, you know, and I can, I just enjoy whatever I'm happy with. And I'm happy with that. That reminds me of this one thing that we used to do. So we, when we first moved down to Texas, my dad and my stepmom were just down here because they worked in oil and gas. And so it was, I mean, maybe nine of us without just offhand, without me trying to count. And remember who was down here at the time because it was really messy. People back and forth, step parents, whatever. And we had this huge house, but it was empty. We really couldn't afford to live there. And they were just barely, barely scraping by, right? At some point, we started selling candy to try to pay bills. But anyway, uh, we would put our beds into the hallway and you have like this, it's kind of an upstairs living room, but it's called a game room. We would pull our beds in the hallway. We would run and we would jump off of the mattresses into the game room and just, you know, barrel roll on the ground. But that's all we had. Like we had our one TV that was downstairs in the family room, a big back TV. Uh, maybe we had one game with one controller. We had a Sega Dreamcast maybe at the time. Very underrated system, by the way, since we're both gamers. Very underrated. Uh, and we had two beanbag chairs. I think everybody had beds, and that was it. We just, but we just took that space. At one point, we had our house shoes, and we were playing, like, we were boxing with them. <laughs> like, we were literally boxing. So you just find ways to make the most of your situation. And I was literally talking to my dad a couple hours ago about that. Like, he, and, and you know, Parents, I feel like their usual response is, you know, we just did the best that we could. Like we we tried. This is what we had. And for like some kids, they understand. Like it sounds like you, Dr. Vic, and, and myself, 
we kind of look back fondly on those times because we just made the most of it. And we just figured out how to have fun with our brothers and sisters and our cousins. And we just made it work. <laughs> yeah. I so, mean, it, you do the best you can. Right. And in that way of just, I mean, we used to play a game. I remember we had these rubber rec- wrestling figures that we got handed down to us. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Where we got them from. Um, and man, we used to play with that for years. I mean, throwing them off a roof. I go up, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to try to do a body slam from the top of the roof. I'm gonna go through my bedroom window. And I go and I try to oh, place goodness. it. I'm like, Hey, throw it back up here. I missed. Let's keep trying. And we'll just do that the over and buttons. over. Yeah. And just, and just, you know, <laughs> have fun in all these different ways. And, uh, it, it was a blast. I mean, cause you, you made the, the best of whatever you had and whatever situation. That's fun. And that's funny. But man, okay, so we go from being kids, right? You're figuring stuff out and then you get through high school and you're probably showing those kids like, all right, yep, you got the sleeves, you may have the glasses, but watch this. When I get out here, I'm going to make you guys look silly. Uh, so what position did you play before we jump into college? Uh, so in high school, uh, I was an outfielder. Um, for, for So I played for two different teams. So in high school, I played for my high school team, which was left field, and uh, I, was, I was a closer. And then, in, uh, and I didn't pitch too often. It was only when really needed or something. But the other team I played for, I was center field. That was my prime spot. I loved it. Um, that was a semi So you can fly. Spot. I'm a lot faster than what people think. Yeah. And yeah. I was able to run that. Like, so when I, when I, when I went to, <clears throat> when I was uh, before, when I played rugby for Arizona State, which I know we're going to get into that, but um, I finally timed my sprint to see how fast I could run a 40. And, uh, it was like a four, four, five. And I was just like, holy cow, I can't believe I can do that. Um, but rugby helped me with that. Um, and so, yeah, but people would, uh, you wouldn't think, uh, my size of, that I can run that fast. That's pretty cool. Uh, you talked about sports a lot and what I listened to just talked about how it just helped you to cope It say it, it kept you sane and it taught you a bunch of life lessons. Um, but eventually and this is where our next number comes in. And that is $207 because that's how much a one-way flight to Phoenix, which I know, you know, Arizona State is in Tempe, but, you know, I had to find a flight. <laughs> the soonest one was $207 for two days from now. So that's what I went with. Uh, How did you get to Arizona State? Take us through that because you go from Chicago to base basically the West Coast. I don't know if they consider it West Coast out there, but so Close. how'd that happen? You know, I was, I was at a period in my life where um, it was one of the things where I wanted to just make a big change in my life. I was tired of the mm. life I was living and I just felt like I needed to just pick up and make a drastic change. And I was going into computers because my dad kept saying computers is where the money's at, blah, 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 blah. I love computers. I, I built them for fun. Uh, and so it was one of those things I was like, all right. So I looked at the school and it was top like in computer science, I think ranked two or four in the nation. So I was like, cool. So my dad, the year before he, we were able to get out there and uh, I saw the school and I was just like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And it's beautiful. It's sunny. It's warm. And I'm like, and uh I was like, I had an aunt who lived like 45 minutes away from there. So I was like, um, I was like, so I'm like, just let's do it. I want to, I fell in love and I made the choice and it was a big, it was a big move for me. Cause I'm, you know, I'm a mama's boy back then. And, uh, to leave a small little town and, and go somewhere where, you know, moving away to college wasn't that popular for where I was, where I was born, where I was at. And, uh, so it was one of those things where I was adamant to make a change in my life. And, um, uh, very happy about it. I mean, there's so many beautiful things. I got to learn so much about myself uh, in so many ways. But it was, it was, it was cool. I was out there for a year and a half, and I, it was, it was a really good time. I, like I said, I was playing rugby for the club team. Um, I can get into how that happened too, but yeah, I really loved it. Yeah, tell us about rugby. What was, <laughs> what was your college experience, college experience like out there? Yeah, you know, it was a lot of fun. It was different because the way I was brought up, well, brought up when we go out to parties and stuff, we would like doll up. We're Italians. We drove, we always look, we got to dress really, really nice, you know. And so here I am going to a college in, in Arizona. And I remember I'm like, we're going, hey, we're going to a party over here. And I loved it. It was just parties all over the place. 
Uh, it was funny because I was going there and then they got raided from Playboy to be number one party school in the United States. And I'm like, great. That's, you know, that's why you're going there. You want to party. I'm like, when have I ever been a party person? I mean, I like to go out and have party, go to parties, but you know, um, it's one of those things, but going there, uh, I remember, uh, I was like, so I was big in baseball and I loved baseball so much that in my high school, there were some things that didn't work out. I made a couple errors in my second year and, uh, I had a really strict coach and never saw the outfield mm. again. So, and he tried to make me play first and I mean, I learned how to adapt to it, but I wasn't, that wasn't my, I wasn't that great at first. Um, and then there were some political things, coach's son, this kind of thing happened. So oh. that's why I played for two different teams. So like, I never really saw my stardom that I didn't really get, I didn't have the support. So the other thing, I don't want to blame them. It was me. Cause I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't have really good self-esteem. So if I wasn't with a team that had really a lot of good support from a coaching standpoint, I wouldn't do well. And if I had right. a lot of good support from the coach, then I, I excelled like crazy. Yeah. And so I played for a team that was in an adult league and you had to be 18 and older and I'm 16, but I was a big kid. So I looked like I was 18 and uh, I killed it there. So I'm playing for two teams, not supposed to be doing that. That's the reason why that happened. But I went to Arizona State and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try and play on for the baseball team. Why not? They had a tryout. I found yep. out when it was and I was like, great, let's do it. 150 guys. It comes down to wow. me and another guy. And the coach asked me probably six times throughout the day, who are you? Why haven't I heard from you before? You're, you, you're, you're, you're fast. You got a strong arm. You're hitting like a beast. He goes, why haven't I heard from you? Heard about you? And I said, well, you know, high school shared the same story. Unfortunately, they were like the number two baseball team in the nation at that time. And they're like, we don't take risks. And I was like, oh, come on. This is what? I had a chance. And I'm talking to the scout. I'm, I remember I got the, I got that answer. I'm walking out. And I'm talking to him and I go, man, you guys, he goes, that's just how it is. I go, come on. You guys are scouting so-and-so. There's a guy I played baseball against. And I go, I've struck him out one time. And he goes, oh, so what's, what's the scope on him? What have you know? I'm like, hold up. You're going to try. I mean, he's a good player. He's phenomenal. I was like, I go, but I'm at the same caliber of what he is. You saw what I can do. I'm like, come on, give me a shot. And he's like, unfortunately, I can't. The coach has the final say. And I was like, dang it. So I remember coming back home that night and, uh, there was a guy from Chicago in my dorm room on my floor. And he's like, he was, he's like, how to go? You know, we're just chatting. He's like, how things go? I'm like, man, I didn't make the team. I go, I'm so frustrated about that. I go, came down to me and another guy, 150 guys. Come on. I killed it. Give me, just give me one shot. Or let me just, let me pinch hit once in a while. Like whatever, I'll, I'll play my best. But, and he's like, he goes, well, what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing? Like, I think it was either, it was either that night or the next night. He's like, what are you doing? Uh, let's say the next night. And I'm like, nothing. Why? He goes, why don't you come check out rugby? I'm like rugby. Mm. I'm like, nah, I don't want to play rugby. That's that's a that's a brutal sport. He goes, you play tackle football. I'm like, oh, I've been playing tackle football since like nine years old. He goes, you'll handle rugby. He goes, why don't you just come out and practice? You, it's a good exercise. So I was like, cool, let's do it. And so the next night I go out and practice. Man, I was getting. I, it was a lot of conditioning. But I was like, you know what? I can continue practicing with you guys. You guys mind if I just practice with y'all? I mean, I'm not going to probably play, but I'll just practice. I'm like, yeah, you can come as much as you want. All right, beautiful. After a couple more practices, I was like, I think I want to learn this thing. This is fun. And wow. it's, uh, rugby is like one of the coolest sports I ever played. And I played a lot of sports in my life. Rugby was one of the most coolest sports I ever played. It's extremely mental, a lot more than what people think. Um, and the guys and the camaraderie, you know, I'm playing with guys from all over around the world. You know, a guy from Japan, South Africa, uh, different part, of, another guy from another part of Africa. Uh, I think Nepal, if I'm not mistaken, or, or somewhere along there, um, Europeans, England and Scotland and all that. So just having all these guys from different, it was just so cool. And they, rugby has such a beautiful, like um, there's certain traditions and just certain ways they do things. And I just really respected that. And I was like, man, these guys are like brothers to me. And I had a, I had a blast with it. It was a lot of fun. Um, I got to play, and even though it was a club team for Arizona State, I got to play against all D1 schools. Um, which was kind of cool. So, and I, I remember going against uh, the number one rugby team in the United States, and man, they were beasts. Uh, they had the they had a guy who played my position, and he was just he drove me back like fifteen meters. Big dude, but I, I take him down, but I couldn't I couldn't uh, tackle him to hold him down because you know you wrap him up. But then he just let go of the ball, and then you know next thing he's getting back up running again. And I was just like so exhausted from chasing this dude. I was like, I'll let him in. Forget it. I'm done. <laughs> So, but yeah, that was my experience to get into rugby and it was, it was a phenomenal experience and, uh, yeah, I got to play for a year and, uh, uh, it was a sport I, I thought about getting back into, but, uh, unfortunately due to some health stuff, I wasn't able to. You never thought, man, I could just, because you had this tryout, 
clearly you were a D1 baseball player. Because if you can make it to the last two on the best team in the country, I mean, the 10th best team, the 20th best team, you probably could have been starting for one of those teams. So you never thought about, and this is a while ago before the transfer portal was a thing, but you never thought about, man, I may need to literally pursue baseball until I'm kind of tapped out, or did it just sour you on it? There, there was a thought of it. There was a community college nearby, and they were like, you can go try on there, you know, and try to get there, and then you can get on, and then you can try to work your way into the system. You and I thought about it, but then I was guys. yeah, and it was just one of those things where I was like, man, but I came all the way out here for computers, right? So that's where I let the schooling of what I wanted to get into do and take over uh, instead of trying that route. Because somebody did say, there was a guy, I don't know who I was talking to, and they're like, go to the community college right here. It's, it's, it's literally... Um, you're not going to be able to stay at the dorms in Arizona State, but you can go there and you can get an apartment or whatever, and you can go to the community college. You'll, with your skill set, you'll definitely make it on there. And then you can just work your way around to build up. And I was just, again, it was one of those things I was like, yeah, but then I'm like, yeah, but I, I really came out all the way out here for computers. If I'm going to do that, I can go back home and try that. So that's kind of what kind of made that decision. But you live and learn, you know, through the process. But I always believe there's always, because there came other opportunities uh, to play. Um, in, in at that level, and I had some other opportunities that came through. I mean, I played semi pro for a very long time, but it was, um, but by the time I had some like some potentials that would could have like been gave me like uh, I had an insight with somebody who knew a guy can scout me out and he'd do a full report and then put in a good word too. And then it could have really gave me a good chance to go play for something. And it was one of those things where I was just at that point in my I was 22 at the time, and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready, and I was 23. And I was like, I'm getting ready to go to chiropractic school. I think I'm going to call it reps for my whole thing on baseball. And I'm like, I'll still play. And I still did. I played until I was, I played baseball until I was 29 years old. And then I played uh, softball until I was like 33 or 34, the 12 inch. Um, but it was one of those things where I was like, you know what? I'm going to become a chiropractor. That's where I'm going towards. And what's the cool thing about that process is I get to work with baseball players and I can help them. So you just kind of. You still found a way to be around the game to, and you just, you can still play. And I think that's the part that, that most people who either didn't get their opportunity or missed an opportunity or something like that want to play. Like that doesn't go away just because you clearly love the game. Once you get as good as you are, that takes a lot of hard work. That takes a lot of skill. And you don't want to just, you know, give it up because somebody says, You can't make this team. It's like, ah, man, you know, screw you. Whatever, man. I can play baseball. You just don't understand. So I do think it was really cool that you continue to find a way to stay around the game and play the game. Right now, I'm 33, and I still like to play basketball. I'm a coach at my high school, and I enjoy being on the court. That's that's still first for me. now. Depends on how long my body can continue to deal with running up and down the court. Got a little lower back stuff. You can check that out for me. But um, you talked about becoming a chiropractor. What was it about being a chiropractor? Like, how did you start to get that switch from you went from computers, there was some business that's kind of in there, and then you go, okay, I want to be a chiropractor. And before you answer, our next number is 1,677 days. Because according to LinkedIn, that's how long you've had your practice, four years and seven months. So, yeah, I think that was good too. (laughs) How'd you get into chiropractic? Yeah, so a little backstory. My mom has been a fitness instructor since I was one years old and yoga instructor for the last 20 years. And so um, health has always been programmed to me to be exercise, nutrition, and taking supplements. And so at 13 years old, I started that journey on working out. And uh, being a kid who was always said I was husky or my mom would be like, oh, you have a natural belly, which I was like, what's a natural belly? Um, <laughs> and so at 13, I, I was like, I wanna, I'm tired of this natural belly that I have. I want to have a six pack. Can you teach me this and this and this? And so long story short, 15, I got my six pack and then 
But what happened was at 19, as I'm, I went to playing rugby for Arizona State, and I'm in I'm in great condition. I mean, I can run a five minute mile. Um, I'm, I'm, my my strength is through the roof. How much I can lift weights. And it was one of those things where um, every month my health was getting worse. And I started sell, I started teaching myself nutrition at 16. I started learning biology and all these other things. So at 19, I'm like, man, I don't get it. I'm having, you know, I'm between canker sores in my mouth. I had acne on my back. Which I never had acne ever in my life. Um, to, you know, digestive issues and headaches and migraines and, and, and jaw issues, TMJ issues, carpal tunnel, all this stuff. It was weird stuff wow. just coming all over the place from all different angles. So I'm like, mom, I remember it was like April, I'm about May and I'm uh, end of April. And I'm like, mom, I, I need to, I think I need to see a medical doctor. Here's what's going on. And she's like, all right, let me get, I'll get something booked when you come back. And so it took over a month just to get that appointment. So it was like middle, end of June, but it was a little over a month. And, uh, three or four days before my mom's like, Hey, why don't you go see Dr. Frank? And he's a chiropractor. I was going to go, I was seeing when I was like nine and a half, 11. My mom's been seeing him since I was one years old. And she's like, I'm like, well, if you can get me in very soon and you know, you think he's help, let's do it. Got me in the next day. And he was like, you know, what, we're going to have to do a lot of work. I can help you out right before you go back to school. And then, you know, you still need to see a chiropractor for the rest of your life. He was the one who was, I, I always joke about it. I'm like, you got me to, you told me I couldn't play organized football when I was a kid. And you also told me I had to stop playing rugby. Um, you know, so because he's like, you got to stop playing rugby because I had scoliosis. And so I was like, man, this sucks. I had such a great brotherhood with these guys. I feel like these guys are like my family for away from my family. I'm like, it's going to really, and it really did. It really bothered me. And I didn't know how to handle things back then. So I just kind of like shut myself away from them uh, because I just felt so bad about it. Um, but long story short though, Two months, all my symptoms are gone. Four months, I get in the best condition of my life. Now, you understand, I've been playing rugby for a year, and I worked out. I still kept my workout routine. I wasn't the most shreddest. I wasn't shredded like I thought I should be. Uh, I was always feeling bloated. I always had a bloated stomach and all these other things. In four months, without changing anything except chiropractic in the mix, I went down to 10% body fat, and I was about 212 pounds at the time. And it was one of those things where I was like, how the heck is this happening? I remember coming yeah. home. So that's what, so long story short, when I had the two months of chiropractic care in the summer, I went back to Arizona state and I decided to change my major to business. And then I made the decision that it wasn't worth me staying there anymore because I was looking at it from a financial standpoint, like how much I was going to rack up back then. It was only, it was like 25,000 a year. Uh, now it's probably like 50. So it's like one of those things where I was like, man, with that plus chiropractic school and everything else, I mean, I'm taking loans out like crazy to do all this. So I was like, I'm not, I'm like, I'm going to go back home. I'll do, I'll go in the business because. Uh, I have to learn science anyhow when I go to chiropractic school. So why go learn it and then go learn it again where I can just go ahead. I mean, you're going to go much more in depth in school there. But I was like, I'd rather just learn the business side because that's what I want to do is have my own business sometime. And so that's what brought me back home to Chicago to uh, finish up school at UIC and and then uh, before I ventured off to Dallas. So when was the moment that that you kind of started to look at it from more of a business. Did you always just want to have your own practice or did it start kind of like, okay, I want to be a chiropractor and then you end up having your own practice or did that come further down the line? No, I always wanted to have my own business. I, mm. I was always one of those things where, um, you know, I, my, I meet people, my, maybe friends of my dad or somebody who had a business and they were kind of well to do. And it was just one of those things that attracted me because it was like, uh, you know, I, I, again, not coming from finances, I learned what I didn't want to have. So I was like, okay, I want to have my own business. I want to do this. And it, it, I'm happy I made that decision because when I was coming out of chiropractic school, it was one of those things where I was like, I can't work for somebody because not because I'm, I can't, it's just my vision's too big. And I, I, there's a way I want to do things in a certain way. I want to do it in the way I want to apply it. I don't want to be held to someone else's standards. I want to do it my way. Um, and that's kind of what happened after the fact. But yeah, it was when I was, it was when I made that decision, I was like, well, eventually I might want to have to own my own business. Why? Because I saw the chiropractor who I was going to, he had his own business. He ran the business. And so I was like, in my head, I'm like, that's what I'm going to end up being is running my own business. And so I'd rather go learn business. So that way I can, when I come out of school, I can run my own business then. Man, you just started to really kind of put things together, like step by step. Like, okay, this happened. All right, great. Now, what do I want to do? I want to do business. Okay, I want to be a chiropractor. Okay, I want to have my own practice. Okay, let's do that. What's the best way to do that? Go back home. 
I'd rather just go back home. It was like, boom, boom, boom. It didn't seem like it just took much waffling. Like you figure out what you need to do, you make a decision, and then you go. Have you always been that way? Yeah. Um, I think growing up I had to. You know, I had to deal with a lot of things and you you uh, I had to deal with the circumstances of what showed up. So I've learned to then make a choice and just deal with whatever comes with it. Not like, but don't be wrong. I did question a lot because when I was, when I got it, when I went to um, Arizona State, I wanted to get in the computer. I was in computer science. And I remember I had to take Java programming. I hated it. I did not like programming whatsoever. I was like, I got to stare in front of a computer for hours at a time doing this stuff. Like I had to make a bank account, checks deposits if it's negative this. And I made the program for it. And I was just like, this isn't fun. I'm asking my neighbor to help me because I have no clue what the heck I'm doing. I don't understand this stuff. It's like a foreign language. And, uh, so I'm like, I'm going to go and try to change my major. So that's, I waffled with that, but then, you know, but then all of a sudden, but other things in my life, it's, you know, you just, I've had to learn to deal with things. And so you just learn to like, Hey, I'm just gonna make the choice and I'm going to go forth. And if it doesn't work out, that's fine. I'll, 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 I'll just as time goes. And, mm-hmm. um, that's been, I would say later in my life, it became more like that. Uh, I would second guess myself a lot when I was younger. Um, but as I, in my 19, 20, 21, 22, I'm starting to full, I'm starting to step into my own shoes and live my life the way I want to. I feel mm-hmm. like I have more control over my life. And that's when I started to be that way. I'm like that hundred percent now where it's like, nope, this is what we're going to do. Let's go. We're making that choice and let's go forward with it. It's funny because like people talk about, at least from a male side, becoming a man, you know, being your own man and that kind of stuff. Like you don't really know. There's not like a set time or experience. You just kind of know it. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of my own man now. It's like, I think one of the things that is a characteristic of it is you're able to just make your own decisions. And I feel like be more stern in those and more sure about them. And I feel like you take less crap. You know, <laughs> when you feel like you're your own man, um, what would you say about that? I mean, you dumb tons of stuff. You're a doctor. People should listen to you. You would think. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's one of those things. I mean, look at men. We don't have a rite of passage. You know, most like indigenous cultures or other cultures, they do rite of passages for men. We don't have that. I think for me, one of the biggest things, and, and, and it, was, it didn't hit until I had my own business. That's where... Uh, I had to step into that way because growing up, I had always opinions around me, right? And I cared about those opinions. Like if it comes from my parents, I cared about their opinions. I let that play an influence on me. When I was away, their opinions didn't matter as much. I get to choose what I want to do, right? And so that's what allowed me to taste that and play that and go down that route. And then there were circumstances I had to deal with. And when they show up, I I, I mean, there's, I mean, not everything I made a choice on, a lot of things I made a choices on failed. Or weren't great, but you know it's a living experience, and you learn from it. But then, how to know how to handle those things? You know, I didn't. I wasn't. Yes. You know, so it's like there's different things I had to learn. But it wasn't until my business where, and it was a couple of years in, probably a little more. Um, and I have to give credit to my wife because she's been she's my rock and everything. Uh, but having her around and 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 just going through what I everything, um, that's I think where I learned about like what it, it really means to be a man. Like I had ideas of it. And I was doing certain things like it. I remember one of my friends when I was in chiropractic school, he was, he's, a, he's about 15 years older than me, but he, uh, he lived in the Dallas area and he was a patient of mine for a little bit when I had, when I was like, Hey, I'm an outpatient, I'm an outpatient clinic. Why don't you come see me? It's, a, it's, you got a discounted price and, uh, you got me. So what do you say? And I really appreciate it. He did come. He was consistent too. And I, it helped me out with my numbers, but long story short, I remember him saying, I was complaining about a girl I was dating at the time. And he's like, you're not, re- you're not a man enough to be ready for that relationship. And I was like, man, what do you mean? I ain't man enough. Uh, here comes my ego. And then, but I know what he means by that now. Like there's just, and it's interesting. When did this happen? I don't know if I could put a pinpoint of a day or a time, but I know that it was in the era of, it was like, it was literally, I think it was probably like a few, a couple of years into my, I was when I, I know when I, when I, I had to be about two, a little over two, three years. I think it was right when I got married with my wife, things start right around. It was not the exact moment, but it was near that time where things started to shift. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I was like, all right, this is my wife. This is, this is, there's no more this or that. It's not my girlfriend or fiance. This is my wife. I'm committed now. This is, I mean, I was committed before, but I'm this, I made a commitment. Like here's our vows. Here's what I'm agreeing to. 
this is what this is me and her and that's it and that's when started things started to shift where i was like no it's me and her this is this is me creating my relate my my relationship with her and then my life and i had to own my stuff it's no more i'm sorry how How old old was i then uh man let me see seven years ago so 32 yeah so 32 i got married and it was one of those things where uh might have been 33 no 32 yeah and it was one of those things where um at that point in my life it was starting to uh i can't blame this or i can't not that i was blaming things but i had to learn how i had to take care of myself in certain ways and hold myself to certain standards and uh that's when things started to shift and everything in my life started to shift and it became the point of like, no, this is 100% me in the end of it. And this is what I have to stick to. Here's my rules. Here's my values. Here's this, here's that. This is what it is because you think about it, men, and especially in today's world where we don't get a rite of passage and rite of passage is going out and trying to figure things out on your own. You know, sometimes they throw you in nature and say, here you go, put you in the middle of nature, figure out your way back. And you're going to have to deal with things yeah. along the way that come up and you're going to have to figure it out, learning how to trust yourself, trust your instincts, trust your intuition. Um, I wasn't taught. I mean, I, I trust my intuition. I have very strong intuition and I let it go around 12 to be accepted into the to my family unit, and friends unit. And then at 24, I tried to start developing it back. And um, now my new intuition guides me in everything. If I don't have a good feeling about something, I don't do it. Man, you talked about when you got married, because I will say that was huge for me. And I was 24 when I got married. And so, and that happened. And very early on in our marriage too, um, me and my dad kind of fell out and I was working for him at the time. And so once that happened and shout out to my pops, we're great now. I talked to him earlier. Once that happened, oh, wait, and shout out to the wives, because we can both attest our wives are amazing. We very much would not be where we are or who we are without you all. Shout out. But when that happened, that made me just realize that, okay, like, here we go. It's us. Not us against the world, because we still have people who love us and care about us and will love to help us. But like anything that happens. From here on out, it's between me and God. And that was pretty much it. And I've had that attitude, whether money was good or money not, or, you know, we've always, well, not always, but I would say maybe 95% of our relationship has been amazing, where it was very little strife. And when we made decisions, It was me and you. All right. Hey, let's talk about it. Pros, cons. I better have a plan when I bring anything to her. Uh, So she keeps me, uh, you know, in line in that way. But we made the decisions and we stuck to it. It wasn't about what mom or dad think about on this side or mom on this side or or which friends may think about over here or over there. But it was like, yo, me and you and we riding. If we're comfortable with our decision, we like it, then that's it. And we just went. And so... Like you said, I feel like I had to, I had to be, I had to be a man for my wife. I had to make sure I took care of my business and that, I mean, it's, it's nothing that will really grow you up. Like taking that commitment serious and putting your all into it and don't even talk about kids. Like we just had our kids. So we're going through that experience together. Coach, coach Vic, Dr. Vic. I mean, you do, you do it all. So. Um, we're going to, now we're going to talk about your practice a little bit more. So what are some milestones where you went, okay, this happened. I feel like I'm starting to get a handle on what it's like to, to run a business, to be a boss, to have employees. Because my guess is you have the, the doctor part of it a little bit before you had the business part of it. So correct me if I'm wrong in that, but what are some milestones you feel like you you made some headway in? You were doing some good things. Yeah, no, you're dead on. I mean, I, I had I had the doctor stuff nailed down to a T. I mean, I don't get me wrong, I wasn't a master of it because even in the, there's a gift there, you know, I studied so many chiropractors, good ones too. And 
And they always, they always say there comes a point where you don't even have to think everything. You'll just come to you on what you need to work on with someone. It's very, and I was like, cool. I would love to learn when I get to that point. But, um, and I did, it was like three years, right? Three, a little over three years. All of a sudden I was just like, no, I, have to feel, I, I know what I need to do. It's just some, it's just, it's like a call. I'll just know what I, what shows up when I'm there. It's like, it's really some cool things, but, um, yeah, I mean, the business was rocky. It wasn't rocky. I mean, I, grew, I mean, you know, I did decently. I did well for the most part, but it was it, the problem for me was um, the student loans. I mean, I came out of school in 2009. October was just last year. The year, October 8, 2018, 2008 in October was just happened. Uh, countries in a recession and all oh, the banks, you know, did what they did. And so by, you know, I didn't start my business in 2010 and, um, you know, there was one of those things where student loans, I mean, they were, they were, I mean, I had six months before I had to start paying. So I had a cushion. And then once I had to start paying, they were like, you're paying in full. And I'm like, wait a minute, come on. I, I'm not making money. I'm trying to start a business. I'm like, can you work with me here? And like, well, you can forbearance. And of course, forbearance is add like 10,000 on top of it. It's, it's such a racket of a game. I mean, literally, I, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not. Really one, started, doc. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things I joke with people. I don't joke. I mean, I paid like $150,000 worth of my student loans in, in, in the last 10 years. And, uh, probably even more of that, but, uh, I owe more than what I did when I first pulled, go figure that. Tell me how that math works out. But, uh, I wish I, I wish I was, you know, those numbers worked in my favor for things. But one yeah. of the things is though, so they weren't being forgiving. So I ended up, you know, I was struggling because I, I here's the practice it's, it, it, it's growing. It's just taking time, but it's growing. I mean, I doubled my business from my first year to my second year. So things were moving up, but I just wasn't making enough to cover my end for personal. And so I ended up, I mean, there was a point where I had to make a choice and to go bankrupt. And I did for personal reasons, not the business side. Um, but I felt like things were starting to shift after the second year. By the second year, I was kind of having like a little bit of some breathing where I'm like, all right, well, it was like two and a half years in because I, I started middle April 2010 is when I started. Uh, so you figure out, like, well, that's not really a full year. Then I had my full year. So my second, by the time I was at my second full year, um, I started to feel like I had momentum behind me. I finally was, you know, that's right after I went bankrupt. It was like a, it was like a launching pad for me because like three, four months later, I felt like I can breathe now. I had money coming in where I can cover, you know, I can cover, I mean, I can, I had disposable income now. And so that's where I was able to start to reinvest into the business and start doing things. And then a year later, I'm, I'm going from a 758 square foot office, um, a little over a year later to, um, a 3000 square foot office. And this is when I really felt like, okay, here's my opening moment. I was in a basement of a professional building and now I'm going out to a storefront and I was like, I'm really going to be seen and so forth. And that's where the momentum started. Cause that was the year I almost doubled my business again. But this time I'm, I it was, it was I basically in two years, uh, three X my sales and 5.5 X my profits, which was awesome. But that's when I wow. felt like that was a milestone for me. Cause I had momentum as I felt, um, in that process to where, I'm like, man, this is really working now. Like it's it's starting to, this is great. But the, as a, a little segue into all that, um, I was I was doing everything business people tell you to do, like grind, hustle, sweat equity, all those fancy terms. Um, by the time I hit my financial peak five years in, I was burned out every four to six months. I was unfulfilled, mm -hmm. not satisfied. So I know we're talking about milestones, but this was a milestone because what happened was is I finally realized, oh, I told my wife, I don't know if I want to continue. If this is how it's going to be, always going upstream and all this, this is just not how it should be. And so we reconfigured, we did some deep soul seeking and we realized, okay, we're going to choose, we're going to choose the office to be a little different. Cause my wife at time, when we were making these decisions, she worked, she managed the office. Um, and so we decided to take a 40% hit on purpose. But basically what that means is we let go of patients that didn't fit the office of what we were changing it to. We started to focus on pediatrics which was a milestone for us because, well, hold on. It was a milestone that year um, because I wanted to have 50% pediatric vo patient volume, which means out of all my patients that come in the office, 50% were at the age between zero and 17. And uh, so we were at 5% January, 2017. And by the six months in, which was July of 2017, I was at 48%. So big milestone there because we were, we were, again, we, we, and we didn't do nothing different. This is some of the things I do with coaching and how that got created. But it's one of those things where that was a huge moment for us because I was really choosing what I really wanted for the first time mm -hmm. instead of being like, I have to make sure because, again, I grew up as a people pleaser. I always had to be paying attention to people's feelings and all that stuff. And here I am now um, choosing for the first time. I'm what now at that point in my life, 
uh, was that six years? So I was 32, 33, right around my, right after my, no, 33 and 34, actually 34, no 33. Sorry. Yeah. 33 years old. And it was one of those things where I'm like, finally for once in my life, choosing what I want and not caring what anyone has to say. And I was stepping into what was authentic for me. And, uh, and it, and it all worked out. I mean, I mean, there were so many different things. I, I, I changed my business around to where I only worked 14 and a half hours a week, um, yes. which was a no, no in the family wellness world. It was a no, no in pediatric world. Chiropractors say you can't, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, pregnant moms, if they're coming in or if they're bringing their kids, you need flexibility for them. And I was like, listen, I'm going to attract whoever's going to want to come here. I'm not going to try and try to chase everybody. And here's what I want to do. Cause this fits my lifestyle. I can spend my wife loved the three day weekends. Um, she liked the day off during the week and, you know, and I was like, Hey, we're going to make it happen. And we did. And, uh, that was a milestone for us. And then, you know, just, you know, there's other milestones along the way with awards, which I really don't care about. That's why I don't talk about them too much. I have a, I have a lot of awards, but I don't, you know, again, the, I always say the award, I learned this from, you know, who Jerry Seinfeld is, right? I mean, who doesn't, you what? know, I, I'm just, yes. I just had to ask, you never know. You never know. Okay. Number one, he's the, he's the most, well, he's the wealthiest comedian in the world, right? Um, mm-hmm. one thing I didn't know about him, he's on his, his show, uh, uh, comedians and cars having coffee and he had Eddie Murphy on there. I think it was Eddie Murphy. Correct me if I'm wrong, whoever's listening, but I thought it was Eddie Murphy and Eddie Murphy calls him out and says, you never accepted an award ever in your entire career. He's like, why? And what he said changed my whole thought process. And I've been like this since. And he said, it's not about getting a trophy that matters. The award is doing what I get to do every single day. And I just was like, I'm stealing that. Here's a man, number one comedian in the world, does not care, never accepted one award ever. And uh, so it's one of those things where that's why I don't care about awards. But yeah, those are those were some big, those are our big milestones in the office. And we had some other ones that continued down the road, but like, you know, hitting peak numbers or, you know, the, kind of breaking through some things. But um, those were the major ones, uh, in my office that we, we had. So how'd you go from that to now getting into podcasting and the books and really all the sharing? Like, okay, I've done all these great stuff. Now I want to help other people in a different way. Yeah. What ended up happening was, so through that experience in 2017 of doing things totally different, learning, teach, you know, basically I call it now it's, 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 it's effortless success. Um, I took in things. So when I was in chiropractic school, I studied energy medicine, not in the school outside of it, um, to learn more about healing. Uh, and I took about, you know, 12 different courses. I studied, I became a Reiki master and trainer during that time. And, but what happened was, is I, I learned through energy healing and learning the principles of it. I actually learned quantum physics. I learned universal laws. I learned, um, I studied a lot of ancient wisdoms, got into spirituality stuff. And that was a lot of things. So when I when I got to the point of when I was in 2016, where I was like kind of like fed up where we were, this mm-hmm. is where I said, well, if I'm the creator of my life and everything's based on vibration, then obviously I can I can define success, what it means to me. And I can choose it how I like to have it. And all I have to do is just focus on my vibe and it's all going to work out. And so this is a point of me letting go, not focusing on the biz like I used to and all the reins and making sure we're continuing that growth and everything. And literally taking a step back and being like, I'm just going to let this thing take its course. I'm just going to do the one thing that matters is just focus on me and my vibe, focus on my vision and what I want to have for the office and all those things. And that's why 5% to 48% happened in six months. Um, That's why, you know, like I had visions of moms coming in, bringing their kids, and they all choose the appointments roughly around the same time. So the moms can all hang out. We used to have before COVID, we had teas and waters, bananas, apples and stuff for the kids. and and, and, And we had a little play area. So the moms come hang out and it would happen. Moms will come meet at come at the office and they go on a play date with the kids. And that was happening. You know, it wasn't six months. It was maybe like a year later, but it was all happening. So that's where at that point, at the end, it was like the beginning of 2018. I started to go, I was like, I want to get back into podcasting. I did a podcast in 2012 and it was on health, but I did, I did a hundred episodes in a year, a little over a year, but it was one of those things where I was just like, there's so many health stuff out there. I already do this with my patients. Why am I going to go do that too? Why don't I get into the mindset stuff that I'm really passionate about? And so that's where I started my podcast in 2018 in March or just April. Mar- first episode was March 31st. And um, and then from there, I wrote my first book a few months later. And then six months later after that, I started to get into, I started doing what people call side hustle, um, coaching entrepreneurs, because entrepreneurs and humanity in general, ma- mainly in the Western world, we are very all about doing. and 
I know exactly what burnout feels like because I did it often. I know what it means I have to do and focus on this. What's the next thing? What's the next thing here? How I have to follow this or that? And so I felt like that's where my, my I was kind of getting pushed into it. And I, and I did it. I did it for fun. It was great. You know, COVID came. I had a, I stopped seeking for new clients and I just worked with what I had. And then when COVID was starting to die down, I was looking to start building it back up. And then um, I'm doing it full time now where I don't practice chiropractic anymore because my we, I moved from Chicago. Uh, I moved to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee uh, this last year. And um, when we made the move, um, my wife and I, we looked and I said, well, I'll, I'll just do full time coaching. I mean, I already have a clientele base that I've been working with um, and I haven't really had a chance to put a lot of energy into this. So I already know that once I put this energy into it, it'll grow. It'll grow. And I have a very unique message and I have a very unique way of doing things. And with my diverse background and all the things I've done through the last 10, 12 years, um, I can come at so many different angles to help individuals uh, to teach them this principle of effortless success. And so that's kind of what led me into what I'm doing now. I appreciate that. My hub is my website. So my website's empoweryourreality.com. On there, I do a free discovery call for individuals who like what I'm talking about and they're like, I want to learn more. We hop on a call. I get to know about you, your pain, your struggles, your dream life. What do you want to achieve in your life? What matters? And then um, I'll share a couple tips to help you in the way. And then the real purpose of the call too is just to qualify to see if I can help you. And if I know mm -hmm. that I can, I'll offer that information. I have free resources on the website. You can connect with my podcast and I have a free ebook on the power of visualization. Uh, you can also download the first chapter of my book. Um, and then I have social media, bottom left corner. You can connect with me. I'm on all Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and TikTok. Um, I highly recommend, you know, if you have any questions, reach out to me. I love hearing from people. Man, you know, I have a couple of background, you know, health I can get into too, but uh, I'll, I'll keep it to very, the, what I'm doing now. So you don't have to to either a work hard to be successful mm. and to success truly really be effortless. Now, say that one more time for the people in the back. Yeah. So <laughs> you don't have to work hard to be successful and, and success can be effortless. Excellent. I love you. Okay. And oh, here we go. If you were weren't in this right the empowerment um because you're doing that full time what field would you be working in so if it wasn't chiropractic and it wasn't because you know eventually i want to get back into chiropractic but if it wasn't chiropractic and coaching um you know I, computer science i'm sorry computer science i wouldn't go to computers <laughs> I, I thought it was cool but i, I just man i I'm sitting in front of a computer all day is not my thing I'm a people. I have to talk to. I'm I'm, I'm an introvert, which is funny because I. But I have to connect with people. It's it's just one of those things. Uh, that's why I love podcasting so much and, and so forth. But um, I would have to say, one of the things that I really love doing though is um, I have always had an interest in structure of buildings and stuff. So I don't know if that would have been an architect, maybe a contractor. Um, I've always I I mean I loved like I. That's one of the things I I. I flipped the house a couple of years ago and I loved that. I did most of the work with my dad and then you had a friend of his help us a little bit on stuff. I couldn't do like plumbing and electric, but, uh, I've always had an interest in it. I think that would probably be something with building, working with my hands, maybe even be a chef. I mean, I love cooking. That's one of my arts that I love to do is just cook and just let my, let my imagination run wild. I've been cooking since I was six years old. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where, you know, coming from an Italian mom, you know, you learn a lot from her and okay. just knowing how to okay. walk into a kitchen and be like, all right, I know this is that and this and that. I know if I put this two together and put that together, I can mix something up and let me taste it along the way. And I know that I can get it to where I want it to be or whatever. And it'll, it'll come out whatever. And it always, for the most part, comes out really, really good. Not in my opinion, it's what people say. Um, and so, yeah, probably a chef or an architect or some or a contractor. Man, you like and do and are curious about a lot of different things. And I love that. I love it. I'm always telling people, you have to be curious. You have to think. You have to try to be creative. Exercise that muscle. Push that into my kids all the time. I was talking to uh, another teacher, and I was like, yo, your work doesn't have to be everything. I'm sure there are other things that you like that you would like to invest time in. Like Those are the things in life that I feel like that if we begin to kind of, I don't want to say chase after, because that's not really the connotation I'm going after, more just like, just do. Just do those things more. And I think we'd be better better off. But 
That's a different story for a different day. For now, we're going to get into our last what. If I take this clip and I take it back to my kids, take it to my second period, and I go, all right, guys, I have a doctor. And he wants to share some amazing things, advice with you. What advice would you give those kids? Man, I'm going to go back to my 16-year-old self and say what I would love to hear. And that is, you know, if I can say anything, the biggest thing is believe in yourself. I mean, it's, it, and I know that sounds like a cliche. So many people say that, but that's one thing I didn't have as a kid. You know, I, 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 I made it seem like I did. You know, a lot of people thought I had a lot of confidence, but if you really got to know me deep down, you would know I didn't have it. I was just trying to hope for the best kind of a thing. Uh, believing that anything is possible, no matter what, anything in the world is possible to, uh, as long as you believe in yourself, doesn't matter what someone says, doesn't matter what a friend says, doesn't matter what a parent says, doesn't matter what anything a teacher says, no offense there, but it's just one of those things. Cause I've had teachers who I've had, even I've had coaches, I've had teachers tell me things and it's just like, man, why are you kidding me? Uh, and I love to prove people wrong sometimes not in, the, in this day and age, I don't have it anymore, but back then. Yeah. Um, but believe in yourself. And no matter what someone says, believe in your dream, believe in what it is that you you desire to experience and know that in, as long as you stay focused on it, it'll all work out the way it's supposed to and you will get there. I think that is a perfect place to leave off. Uh, Dr. Vic, man, thank you for coming on. I feel like this was an amazing conversation. Just so much wisdom here that people can soak up. One more time, tell people where they can find you. My hub is my website, so just check it out there at uh, empoweryourreality.com.